I have never once in my life told my son that John was a vet, just so everybody is aware of that. And them tax collectors still stink today. Say amen if you're with me. <laughs> you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Genesis. We'll start there, but I'll be uh, traditionally all over the place. I've made a promise today that I won't preach for three hours, so I won't preach for three hours. But I do want to talk today about this idea and the idea of the new covenant, that you and I live in a covenant that is not like the left side of the book. If you take your Bible and you open it up and it says Old Testament, Testament means covenant. And the way that God dealt with people was through certain covenants. God made a covenant with Adam. He made a covenant with Noah, covenant with Abram, covenant with David, covenants with all of these people. And covenants are really important to mine in your life. And I'm going to begin today kind of with some things that I said at Jared and Ashlyn's wedding a few weeks ago. But there are really two major important covenants that you and I enter into in our life. And the first one we see Joey enter into and make profession of today is the new covenant. And it's our covenant status relationship with Jesus Christ. That's, that's the number one most important covenant that I could think of. And if you're here today and you're saved, you say, Zach, I've never heard the word covenant. Well, guess what? You're in covenant with God if you trust in his son, Jesus Christ, and believe on him uh, for eternal life and forgiveness of your sins. You're in that covenant. Now, what's the second most important covenant that you are ever in? Husbands, I'll give you the opportunity to go first. And notice I said, husbands, what's this covenant? Husbands, it is the... It's the marriage covenant. I think those are the two most important covenants that you could ever enter into. Covenant relationship with God and marital covenant status. Isn't it interesting that in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul says that he desired to present the church as the bride faithful before her husband uh, just as and, and told them, he said, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. We see that Jesus is pictured as the bride and we as his people are pictured um, as Jesus is pictured as the groom and we are pictured as his bride, that we are in covenant status relationship together. And I want us to begin today just really thinking about the idea of a marital ceremony all the way back in Genesis chapter 15. Because there is something that's unique in this passage that you and I need to understand. And one thing that really sticks out to me more today than it ever did in my entire life is what this book is about. And this book is solely about Jesus Christ and everything in it points to him and I'm going to use this story today to kind of to begin us here and then we'll move on to a few other places all right so let's read beginning in Genesis chapter 15 and I will start in verse 1 and I think we need to read a lot of this chapter just for uh, context and for understanding it's a really important chapter especially verse 6 stand with me if you would for the public reading of the scriptures Hear now the word of the only living and the only true God. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision, saying, Do not be afraid, Abram. I'm your shield, your exceedingly great reward. But Abram said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless? And the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus, someone that had joined him along the way. Abram said, Look, you have given me no offspring. Indeed, one born in my house is my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, saying, this one shall not be your heir, but one who will come from your own body shall be your heir. Then he brought him outside and said, Look now toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. That's interesting for a man of his age, upwards of 90 years old. He believed in the Lord and he accounted it to him for righteousness. Friends, I want you to note that verse there that it was through Abram's faith that he was declared righteous, not through his works. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to inherit it. And he said, Lord God, how shall I know what I will inherit? He said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, a three-year-old ram, a turtle dove, and a pigeon. Then he brought all these things to him. He cut them in two down the middle and placed each piece opposite the other, but he did not cut the birds in two. And when the vultures came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and behold, horror and great darkness fell upon him. You may be seated. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word. Help us today to see the new covenant. Help us to see you in all the scriptures. 
Lord, we love you and we're so thankful for everything that you do for us. We thank you for this story. Lord, we love you in your name. Amen. My main point today, and I only have two. It may be a quick sermon after all. My main point, number one, is this. That the entire story in the Bible is about Jesus. I'll say it. You repeat it after me. The entire story is about Jesus. You don't believe me. I can tell. Some of you are from Missouri. You say, Zach, show me. I'm from Missouri. It's the show me state. I will. Let me take you to the beginning. When I point at you, the answer is Jesus, okay? So you can say it out loud. This is, this is question answer time. There's a seed that comes from a woman that crushes the serpent's head in Genesis chapter 3. Do you know who it is? There's a faithful son in Genesis chapter 4. His name's Abel. And Abel brings a faithful sacrifice that's able to take care of his people. Do you know who it points forward to? There's a man, even when the whole world goes wicked and apostate, and he's found faithful because God tells him to build an ark that people can come find shelter in, just like somebody in the New Testament comes and builds a church. Noah is found there, and he's planted in a garden as soon as he gets off the boat, just like Jesus was in John 20. Do you know who Noah points to? There's a tower called Babel, and at this tower called Babel, the people are worshiping a false god. When they're worshiping these false gods, God looks down at them, and he scatters them all over the face of the known world. Remember what he did to them when he scattered them at Babel? What did he do? He confused their what? Their language. They couldn't understand. But do you know that Jesus Christ in his church that he built in the new covenant is the direct reversal of the Tower of Babel? Because when the Holy Spirit of God comes in Acts chapter 2, people from all those nations that were scattered come to Jerusalem. And do you remember how they heard them speak? In their own language, in their own tongues. Jesus Christ is the true and greater Tower of Babel story. It's him. Who's Babel about? It's about... No one else. Genesis chapter 15, we're here. God said, Abram, I'm going to give you a kid. If you're 90 years old and don't have a kid, do you even want a kid? Some of y'all 33 thinking, I don't want no more at 33. We got pregnant by accident. That last one wasn't even here. So, Abram is promised, if you remember here in this text, it says that you're going to have so many descendants. I'm going to give them to you. You're going to be as numerous as the stars of heaven. And you look up, Abram, if you can count them, you'll count them. Abram's promise that a seed was coming. Abram's seed is the same seed as Genesis 3. Do you know who the ultimate seed that was promised to Abraham was? You can say it. Who was it? It was Jesus. He has a son. His name's Isaac. He says, Abram, take your son, your only son Isaac. I want you to march Isaac up the hill. March Isaac up the hill. Oh, by the way, Isaac carries his own wood up it. Isaac voluntarily climbs down on his own altar. Isaac's a teenager and Abraham's almost 100. Do you think he could run away from him if he wanted to? He could have, but he didn't. Isaac laid his own self down on the altar. Jesus said in John chapter 10, no one takes my life from me. I lay it down of myself. He looks over and he sees a ram caught in a thicket. Do you know the story of Genesis 21 and 22 and Isaac climbing the mountain? Do you know who it points to? You can say it. Go ahead. It all points to Jesus, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. It don't matter. Remember in Genesis, in the middle of it, in the 20s, when we see that Jacob has a dream and he has a vision and he saw a ladder connecting heaven and connecting earth. And it said that there was the idea that angels were ascending and descending on it. Do you remember that dream? Jacob's ladder. You've all heard about it. They write books about it. They write movies about it. John chapter 1. Philip goes to Nathaniel, brings him to Jesus. Jesus walks up to him and says, hey, Nathaniel. He says, how do you know who I am? He said, you think that's something. You wait till what you're fixing to see, big boy. He said, soon after this, in John chapter 1 in the 50s, he said, soon after this, you'll see angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Jacob's ladder in the dream that connected heaven back to earth. You know who Jacob's ladder pointed to? Go ahead, you can say it. Every one of these stories points you straight to Jesus. Do you remember the story of Ruth and Boaz? How Ruth was somebody that was a nobody that was sent far off in an Exodus story. She comes back in and she needs a kinsman redeemer and her kinsman redeemer's name is Boaz and he takes her in even though she wasn't nothing. Do you know who Boaz points to, friends? Isaiah chapter 7. It says that there was one who was coming that was going to be born of a virgin. Guess who it was? You can say it. It, Isaiah 11, there's one who's coming. He's going to be like a branch, a tender shoot that's going to rise up and be the Messiah. Guess who it is, friends? It is... This story's everywhere. Joseph. Joseph is sold into slavery by his own brothers. He's thrown away. Eventually, he's raised up. He replaces the cupbearer and the baker. He's seated at the right hand. Joseph is then in charge. And guess who the story of Joseph points to, friends? Jesus. You ever read the Old Testament and thought, I don't understand what none of this is about? You ever done it? 
Every bit of it is about Jesus. You ever read Daniel in the lion's den? Remember when Daniel goes down in the lion's den for three days? Comes up back out of it? Remember that story? Down there with the lions and with the wolves in the pit of death and three days later he comes up out of it and a decree is given after he rises from the dead that the whole world worship Daniel's God just like how Jesus in Matthew 28 after he rises up out of the dead three days later he comes up and at the famous, the famous, the famous speech gives the great commission and says that the whole world was now to worship him. You know what the story of Daniel points to? Only one person. Who is it, friends? When you go read about Joshua and Zechariah 3, how there's a priest king whose name is Joshua, literally Hebrew and Greek, if you translate it over, it's Jesus. It's a priest king. Do you know who the prophet, priest, king is in the story of Zechariah? When Malachi says that there's somebody who's coming who's gonna be the messenger of the new covenant, do you, friends, do you wanna guess who it is? Jesus. I want you to note this, though. You hear me out. If it was left up to you, you'd never be made right with God. I wouldn't either. I don't care how good you think you are. I don't care how pitiful you think you are. Nobody in this room can make theirself right with God. That's the purpose of the left side of the book. Here it is. Here's what you could do to be made right with God. Can you keep this law? 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 There is none righteous, no, not one the Bible tells us that no man is justified by his own works so what does God do look down at verse 12 in Genesis 15 when the sun was going down Abram was put into a deep sleep now think about it he's already killed the sacrificial animals he set them on one side and one on the other and back in their day what you would do when you would come into a covenant with somebody you would say I'm going to uphold my end you're going to uphold your end and if we break this covenant guess what happens to the one that breaks it yeah, so they lock arms and they walk through the middle of this covenant. But there's a problem here in Genesis 15. Notice what God just did to Abram. He put him to what? He put him in death sleep because Abram wasn't going to pass through this covenant. God's promise with Abram was not dependent upon Abram. Verse 13, he said to Abram, know certainly that your strangers will be descendants in a foreign land. It's not theirs. They'll serve them. That's Egypt in the Exodus. They will afflict them 400 years. Also the nation whom they serve, I will judge the plagues. Afterward they shall come out with great possessions. Now as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace and be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall return here for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. Now watch this part. It came to pass when the sun went down and it was dark. Behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a burning torch that passed between those pieces. The smoking oven represents God. The burning torch represents God. And it notice how the smoking oven and the burning torch did what, friends? The smoking oven and the burning torch walked down the middle of the covenant that had been split apart and said, I will uphold the agreement. Can I tell you today, friends, that you know what this story points to? The new covenant. And the new covenant man who is Jesus Christ, who is the one who upholds the agreement with the Father so that you can be made right with him. There's no one else that could do it. That's the purpose of the entire story. This whole thing is about Jesus. Look with me on the screen at Romans chapter 10 and verse 4. It says this, for Christ is the end of the law. Now you tell me, was the law given in the new covenant or was the law given in the old covenant? Christ brings an end to the law for righteousness. Okay, for every single person ever that just comes out of their mama's womb, yes or no? For everyone who does what? Now, what's interesting here in Romans 10, 4, when it says end, the word translated there, end, is the Greek word telos. The Greek word telos can mean the goal or the consummation or the culmination. What it means is that Jesus Christ is the culmination. He is the purpose. He is the reason for everything that's on the left side of the book. Say amen if you're with me on that. You say, Zach, I don't get it. Well, remember how Moses, and they would kill those sacrificial Passover lambs? Jesus Christ is the Passover lamb. Remember how they would throw the leaven out of the house? Jesus was buried in the ground. He is the leaven. Remember how the first fruits, they would bring it and give it as an offering? John, 1 Corinthians 15, says that Jesus is the first fruits. Remember in Pentecost and the Old Covenant, how 3,000 people died and Moses got stone tablets and the Ten Commandments were on them? Acts 2, 3,000 people are saved. The law of God is written on the heart. Everything that's in the left side of the book, whether it's the priesthood, whether it's the sacrificial system, it's all a type and shadow that points you to one person. 
He's the greatest person that ever lived. You know, I get tired of talking about a lot of people. I get tired of listening about whether or not LeBron James or Michael Jordan is the greatest basketball player. I get tired of hearing about Taylor Swift. Some of y'all don't stone me, and some of y'all are like, yeah, me too. I get tired of hearing about Donald Trump and Kamala Harris, but I ain't ever one day in my life got tired of hearing about Jesus Christ. His goodness is good every day. And the more I study this God that we love and that we worship and that we've dedicated our whole life to, I am thankful for him more and more every single time I read the book. What a God. I say, Zach, my life's chaos. I know a God that is able to bring you into covenant with him. When you submit to his lordship, friends, that there is something different. There's something different because it brings freedom. But I want you to hear me on this. And I think we take this for granted. I really do. You know how you put your head on the pillow at night and you don't worry about if your sins are paid for? What if Jesus hadn't come yet? Do you realize that every year when they take a, an animal and go sacrifice it and go kill it under that old covenant, that there is a reminder in every animal sacrifice that it's not paid yet, it's not paid yet, it's not paid yet. But Jesus shows up in John chapter 1 and John the Baptist looks and says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You realize what he did? You realize why you don't take an animal sacrifice and kill it under a covenant structure to be made right with God anymore? It's because Jesus is the final sacrifice and through his sacrificial death, burial, and resurrection, through faith in him, you're declared righteous before God. That's the good news, that we are declared. The old covenant can never give you what the new covenant did. The next slide, it tells us about the telos of both covenants. What was the goal? What was the end of them? Well, Romans chapter 6, verse 21, it says this. What fruit did you have then in these things which you are now ashamed? For the end or the telos, the goal of those things, the old covenant, is what? All right, what's that mean? We, you and I are in the new covenant and we still die. Friends, that's not about physical death. That's about spiritual death. The old covenant could never fully make men right with God. Let me say it again. There's nothing else the old covenant could do but keep men separated. It can never give you life. You know why eternal life comes on the scene in the New Testament all the time? John 3, 16, God so loved the world. Whoever believes in him will not perish but have what? Everlasting life. That's new to the new covenant. The goal, the end of the, of the old covenant, those things were death. But now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness, the end, the telos, the goal, the purpose of what God was doing. And what was it? Everlasting life life you have it I want to make a key observation here and it's that the old covenant can only culminate in death but the new covenant in Jesus Christ brings us eternal life when we examine the new covenant friends I want you to understand the reason you have eternal life is because of Jesus and him alone and I don't care what anybody else says there's no other gospel that'll save man from his sins there's no other gospel that'll get a man right with God there's no other gospel that'll get a man to heaven and there's no other gospel that'll cause a man to live for a righteous king right now other than the fact that Jesus Christ and him alone saves and that this book is all about him can we just have an open honest time this isn't deep. Raise your hand if you've ever read the Bible and thought, I don't understand what's going on right here. Can I tell you the key to every bit of it? Let me tell you the person you need to be looking for in every page. Because even me as a preacher, I read it sometimes and think, Lord, you're going to have to help your boy on this one. You know who the key is that I found on every page? Jesus of Nazareth. He's there, man. He's there, he's in all these stories. And he just gets better and better. And the more I read him, the more I see him. And the better I love him. The second point I wanna to talk about today as we examine the new covenant is not just that it's a covenant of life, not that it's just about Jesus. But main point number two, the new covenant is entered into by faith. Now, think about it. If you grew up, let's say you grew up in Jerusalem and you were in the tribe of Judah and you come from the lineage of David, say maybe even you live down in Bethlehem, something like that. As soon as you were born, as soon as you were born, think about it, because your daddy was a Jew and was in the tribe of Judah, you automatically were born physically into the old covenant. Does everybody got that? We good? You could be physically born into the old covenant. But do you remember the conversation that Jesus had with Nicodemus? He told him, he said, Nicodemus, you must be what? 
there's a difference from the old covenant to the new covenant. I have a son named Hudson, he's six. Ty is three, Cam will be one next month. Ty is three, Cam will be one next month. None of my kids are in the new covenant just because their daddy's a preacher. There's a transition. Well, what, what's the transition? The transition is faith, that there is a call to faith to enter into the new covenant. See, these Jews in the first century, they didn't understand that they, why they weren't right with God because they thought they were ethnically Jews, but they weren't. It was all about faith. Look at what Paul said to the Galatians in Galatians chapter three and verse nine. He says, so then, those who are physically born still in the lineage of Israel are blessed with believing Abraham. Is that what it says, yes or no? That's not what it says. So then, those who are of faith receive the promises of Abraham. What was the promise of Abraham? Eternal life, to enter into his covenant. How do you and I share in that? Friends, it's faithful the same way that Genesis 15, 6 said that Abraham did. Abram believed God and it was credited to him as righteous. Zach Davis believed God and through his plan and through his son and through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ and my believing in him that I'm made right with God. Say, Zach, how come the Methodist church, how come the Presbyterians, how come these other people are baptizing their babies and we're not baptizing our babies? How come none of my three boys have been baptized? Well, it's because I don't think the new covenant, we don't think the new covenant is entered into by physical birth. That's an old covenant thing. We think it's entered into by faith. It's not about the water and the amount of water. I had this conversation with Joey on Wednesday night. If he's saved, he's saved right now. He's not saved when me and him get in this water in just a few minutes. This water has no saving power. What this water is is a picture. It's a testimony. It's a spiritual grave. And we're saying, I was dead in my trespasses and sins, but God raised me to spiritual life and he gave it to me. And through faith, we've now been raised and resurrected and are given the promises of what God has given us. John chapter one says this, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. It didn't matter if they were Jew or Gentile. Who were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but they were born how, friends, of who? Born of the Spirit of God. That's exactly what this is about. Friends, you must be born again in the sense that you must pass from death to life, and this is a work of the Spirit, and it's through believing in him. I told you I'd be quick today. I want to end in Jeremiah chapter 31 if you'll turn over there with me. This is one of the most famous new covenant passages in all the text. It gives us some unique things about the new covenant. Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 31. It points to Jesus who could bring us into this covenant. It points to the covenant that leads to eternal life and not eternal separation, death from God. But it's also a covenant about the sovereignty of God, about how God works in a man's heart. Verse 31 in Jeremiah 31. And these days are already here for me and you. It's predicting the time of the New Testament. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant, which they did what? You ever look at them and think, boy, they're dumb. <laughs> you ever look at somebody and think, boy, they keep jacking their life up. If God would have put you in the garden, if God would have put you in Israel, they're in the days of Babylon or a city, then, any of that time, you'd have jacked it up to, you'd have broke the covenant. That's the whole point. We're covenant breakers. We need a covenant law keeper, and his name is Christ. He'd make a covenant not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them. There it is again, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord, that I will put my law in their minds. Acts 2, Holy Spirit, write it on their hearts, not just on tablets, not the letter outside, but the very intent of our motives. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Do you realize that that's the covenant that you are in? 
That's the covenant that you are in. Look down with me a little bit lower there. It says, For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. I think there's a lot of people in the world that say, yeah, Jesus Christ saved me, died for my sins, and they still worry and worry over and over. And we say that we trust Jesus, but we lay on our back and think, what if I don't confess this one? What if, I, what if I missed a sin? What if I didn't confess this one? What if I didn't confess this one? What if I didn't confess this one? You ever notice how sometimes we just keep bringing up all the negative and the bad things that are in our life? I do it and you do it. And the Bible tells us that Christ has cast it as far as the east is to the west. That your sins and your lawless deeds, he remembers no more. Is that not good news? If we went around the room today and I asked you, which I won't, if I said, you ever told a lie? You're going to say, yeah. You ever stole anything? Yeah. You ever took the Lord's name in vain? Or professed that you knew him and lived in wicked ways? Yeah. You ever looked at someone of the opposite sex and lusted after him? Yeah. But if you walk up to the random person on the street and ask him and say, are you a good dude? They're going to say, yeah. And the truth is, that none of us are good dudes. <laughs> We're lying, thieving, blasphemous, adulterers in need of the grace of God. But when you come to this God who saw the chasm, who saw on the left side of the book, he already knew it. He just gave us the left side of the book so you would see it. It ain't about how good you are, friend, because your good's never going to outweigh your bad. And if it didn't matter if, if your good, it did outweigh your bad. As soon as you jack this thing up once, a sinful man can't be in the presence of a holy God. So God laid a cross across the chasm and he said, your sins and your lawless deeds I'll remember no more when you come to my son because it's through him that you have access back to the Father. That's the only way. John 14, Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house are many dwelling places. If it weren't so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you and if I go to prepare a place for you, then I come again to receive you to myself. That where I am there, you may be also. Remember what Thomas said? We don't know where you're going. How do we know the way? Jesus looks straight at him in the face and says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man can come to the Father except through me. Old covenant didn't do it. David wasn't good enough to do it. Solomon wasn't smart enough to do it. And you're not either. But thank God he's been good to you. And he loved you so much that he sent his son and said, you come to me. You come to me. I don't care what you've done. But friends, hear me out here. Just because we say that it's free to come to God, you better count the cost and realize that when you come to God, he declares that he is Lord and that you follow him with your life. Yeah, I just taught the last 45 minutes that salvation can't be lost and I don't think that it can. But friends, just because I'm saved and know the living God, when he saves me and puts his spirit within me, it causes me, we read Ezekiel 36, it causes me to walk after him. If you're here today and you've professed the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and there's never been an instance in your life where it looked like you were bearing fruit or following him, friends, I think that would be serious suspicion about whether or not you need to say, do I know him? But I want us to walk out of here today remembering this, that God's good to us. Is our God not good? He's good. He's good. You're fixing to go eat a meal with your family, most of you are. You're gonna look around, you're gonna see your kids, you're gonna see your mom and dad or your grandparents, and you're gonna say, God gave me that. And you're gonna say, God gave me health. And you're going to say, God gave me the greatest country. I could have been born in Indonesia and in Moscow and wherever else. But God put me in the greatest country to ever exist because he was good to me. It's through his grace that I have it. It's through his grace that I have the ability to live a good and godly life. And I think sometimes it would be good for us just to simply remember the goodness and the grace of God that he showed us in his son, Jesus Christ. I want you to take this book tomorrow. I want you to get up early in the morning. I want you to flip to one of these pages on the left side and I want you to read one of those stories. I opened this up randomly. (laughs) 
You open it up to the book of Judges and the story of Gideon. How Gideon was a servant that was called to throw down the bales. I want you to open this book in the morning and I want you to read it. And I want you to look for Jesus. And I want you to get to the New Testament and I want you to get on your knees before God and I want you to praise Jesus. And I want you to thank God for his goodness in your life. Stand with me. I want to sing a song. Every head bowed and eye closed. You sing it with me. You know it. Miss Brenda's not even going to play just for a second. Let's just close our eyes and you sing this with me.